I think that's large enough. Come on, hang on. Okay, I think that's large enough. Um, I had it once before where I could adjust something so that it would not get too loud, not peak. Uh, all right, that'll have to do. Last week, every evening of last week actually, I took part in a residency. It was called Music for the Not Yet and I was invited to take part in this residency long before the corona crisis, pandemic um, became a reality for us. Um, the idea of the residency was to spend time in a space. The three curators who were also sound artists, dancers and researchers in their own right, they created a little corner in a shared space. I think two of them actually are artists there. It was full of plants, cushions, sofa, gorgeous atmospheric lighting that I wouldn't even know how to deal with. I'm absolutely rubbish with visual stuff. I don't even, I don't get how you get nice lighting. Um, lots of trinkets on the side, little candles, little vases full of fresh cut flowers. Something between like esoteric, hippie dippy, modern hipster self-care. It was wonderful. And in the kitchen, there's loads of chocolates and biscuits and tea and coffee and all these things that are just really normal. And there was sound equipment, there was a mixer, there were cables, there was a record player, there were records. And I was petrified. I was absolutely petrified. first day I went there, all I could do was sit, drink tea, read my book. I'll come back to that book in a minute. I couldn't believe that I was granted this space. I couldn't believe that I was just given free reign to be in this space and to create. By the way, there was no uh, fixed thing that the artists had to create. We could just be in our process. There was a bookshelf as well and uh, yeah, full of great books, which petrified me also because how am I gonna read all of those books within one week and then infuse my sound art with those books? The second day as I was cycling through a now dark, quite cold, but you know, still quite busy Berlin, as you know, we have different lockdown rules. People tend to be out and about a bit more. I was cycling there on the way to the second day of the residency and I thought to myself, okay, what if the space isn't there? What if someone's in the space? What if a dog came and like messed everything up, like ate, ate away at some of the books I left, some of the bits of paper I left? What if somebody's sitting on the sofa smoking? What if everything's rearranged? What if the tea's gone? What if the chocolate's gone? What if the books are gone? I was cycling all the way there. I mean, you'd think I would have used that time to think about something else. Maybe like, what uh, Christmas present I'm gonna send to my mum now that I can't go home for Christmas. But no, I was coming to terms with the fact that I might arrive in this beautiful, gorgeous space that was given to me for a whole week and that it wouldn't be there and that I wouldn't have access to it. And I would be fine with that. I would be fine with the space being destroyed, with me not having access, me not being loud, me losing the space. And I was okay with me losing the space. This feeling made me realize how unused I am and other people like me are to space. How when we are faced with opportunity, 
comfort. I mean, there were blankets as well. We didn't know what to do with it. We feel overwhelmed. We panic that we're not using it properly. We panic that we're not using our privilege properly because we don't know what to do with it.
In 2017, I started a very relaxed, loose, but important project. Um, it's had various names over time. At that time, it was called Voicing Up. I interviewed friends, actually, friends and acquaintances, um, female identifying musicians from the electronic scene in Berlin, female identifying musicians of color from the electronic music scene in Berlin. I just wanted to have a chat with them, really, a chat with them about their work, their situations. I mean, it didn't really come from a happy place. See, I'm an artist educator, actually. I spent the first 13 years of um, my adult career. Is that what they call it? Yes, the first 13 years of my adult career in schools, in schools in Berlin mainly, Berlin and Germany, going in as a, a brown woman who, for, for a lot of the time, looked like a brown young girl, and doing music with the kids, songwriting, singing, all sorts of stuff. I mean, the teachers were wonderful and terrible. Most times I'd just get confused with being the Bollywood dancer, which, quote unquote, the Turkish kids would really love. So I thought to myself, what, you know, does, does this kind of exoticism, does this kind of uh, annoying stereotyping exist in the music world too. I mean, of course it does, right? You know, disclaimer, of course it does, but I wanted to find out. So I interviewed these people and some of the answers were incredible. They would talk about, um, they would talk about having to use a piece of equipment until it broke because they couldn't afford something else. They would talk about ignoring the norms, ignoring these norms that were set up to not include them. For example, not being invited to play at a certain festival or not being invited to play or show a piece at a certain, in a certain space, there's that word again, and how they would just reject that. They would reject that completely and create their own spaces and create their own ways of doing things. So I came up with those terms, stretching, stretching, economically, stretching in terms of skill, stretching in terms of where they would allow their work to go, making it more accessible, maybe because they were rejecting, that was the second term, rejecting the norms, rejecting the spaces that in turn or beforehand had rejected them. The third term that I came up with after these interviews was enduring I quite liked it. It reminded it reminded me of this. Oh, I read this book, Enduring Love, when I was at school. It was for English Lit. I wish I'd been more of a feminist at the time, to be honest. But it was a bit, it was a bit annoying. But I did remember what the uh, rather non-feminist male lit teacher said about the word enduring. It's when something lasts a long time, but it's also putting up with something. So I use that word to describe the third concept, if you like, of stuff that these women go through, enduring the uh, shitty conditions, the lack of funding, the subconscious, subtle microaggressions that feed into their working environments and during the fact that when they turn up to play their own music at a festival or at a club or in a gig that they're not really taken seriously and during the fact that people will just try and hit on them because they're great musicians I mean all of this stuff we know we know all of this stuff don't we but somehow you need to name it. You need to name this stuff for it to be real, for it to be taken seriously. Um, there's this idea of, of, of listing things, right? You list problems, you categorize issues so that they can be brought to the table. I need to find a reference for that, but I'm pretty sure Sarah Ahmed said something about this. In fact, I know she did. I just need to check where it is. To, to insist to be listed, insisting on a list. 
I insist to be listed. You're listed. Then you're important. Importance of lists. We name things to make them real. The word race. We know it's a social construct, but it's still there. It's still a category so that we can deal with racism. If we take away that category, as a lot of people tend to argue, people think it, people are arguing it does more harm than good, but if we take away that category, then um, how can we talk about racism? I mean, that's a very uh, German-specific thing, I suppose. You know, they're trying to get rid of... There was always these ongoing arguments about getting rid of the word race from the um, Grundgesetz. But it has different connotations, I suppose. But anyway, mainly, um, you know, academics of colour, largely women of colour and feminists, um, will fight to keep it in... The idea of naming is quite interesting. I'll return now to that book I was reading during my uh, residency paradise retreat time, as I like to call it. I started reading Glitch Feminism by Legacy Russell because I was teaching feminism and acoustic arts at um, uni and I thought, oh, this is new, I should read this. And then a few other people I know were reading it as well. And it's great, actually. I love the vibrancy of how it's written. And then at one point, Legacy Russell talks about, about precisely that, about naming. And I freaked out when I read it because Legacy Russell talks about how naming something reduces it, reduces its uses. Naming a body reduces the use of that body. And if if there's a body without a name then it's an error and that's a good thing the error is the good thing because that's what goes against the norms that's what goes against the norms that then you know remember those norms have then rejected us in the first place and I thought oh god how am I going to reconcile this idea with my idea and many people's ideas of naming things to be heard to be listed to, to insist on this list to be to be brought to the table. So on the one hand, naming reduces the use of something, but on the other hand, naming allows for a sense of agency, self-naming, I suppose. I talked to with talked to another friend about it during the residency. I was sending voice messages to my artist friend in Brussels, who's in lockdown right now alone with two young kids because her husband's got a new job somewhere else. Can't even think about how stressful that situation might be. So I tried to distract her by, you know, creating a system where we'd send each other voice messages every evening. And um, I told her about the naming. And she mentioned, she told me, Maida is her name. She talked about naming being like a score, being like a set of instructions, being like a set of instructions that were given to follow. I mean, she, she directly related it to naming her own children, actually, and how a name can, can affect how people behave. I thought it was quite interesting. The set of instructions, though, made me think of the word infrastructure and institutions as infrastructures. But anyway, before I go down that path, uh, I want to mention something else first. I want to talk about what I'm currently researching. I'm researching, um, I'm investigating the experiences of female identifying music students of colour in higher education in German contexts. Just to be clear though, these music students are, are not from the classical context, they're from um, popular music. And I made that decision very consciously. I wanted to actually have a line from the stretching, rejecting, enduring, and these ideas that I got from that, um, those initial interviews. And I wanted to combine that 
as I said before, with my 13 years plus experience as being an arts educator, and I just wanted to figure out, okay, what happens then? What happens after school? What happens in these higher education contexts? And um, it's pretty fascinating, actually. And um, all the topics that we that we know, you know, this exoticism, stereotyping, it comes in for sure, especially with pop music, right? Because there's this classic thing of Miley Cyrus is allowed to twerk and then suddenly say that it was just a phase um, of being reckless but then this reckless phase which is then characterized by the twerking actually um, denotes a whole culture of dancing and music which oh belongs to black bodies and brown bodies thanks Miley Cyrus um, I presented my project in a oh, what would the translation be I think it was a, a gender in musicology conference so it was like gender as a topic in musicology and the conference was about all of that so I presented my topic and um, lots of the people presented lots of other things and and it was it was really funny because no one said anything at all no one named anything and uh, luckily for me and my self-esteem, each presentation was followed by a responder. Like they've got this concept, I don't, I've never seen it in the UK before, but I'm sure it exists where somebody's planned, someone plans response or if someone is, someone is allocated to, to respond to the person. Luckily for me, somebody, somebody was there, otherwise I would have had, um, what do they call it, tumbleweed, nobody would have said anything. Oh, and the responder was very kind, wasn't she? I think my project was, was you know talking about racism and talking about sexism and all these very specific things i talked about race based epistemology specifically the way gloria latson billings talks about it and shana almeida and you know it basically is that isn't it it basically means that um epistemologies are bodies of knowing our ways of knowing just don't fit everybody. Our ways of knowing don't. Our ways of knowing are based on the given that uh, the dominant culture is the norm. That was a bit wordy, wasn't it? The dominant culture creates our ways of knowing. Our ways of knowing then propagate the dominant culture. Our our reference points. Our ways of deciding what is correct, what is false, what is in tune, what is out of tune, um, what is noise, what is a beautiful, peaceful sound. Um, so that was interesting. So I talked about that in this conference and uh, what my respondent said to that was, oh, thanks for giving me that title. Thanks for giving me that name, race-based epistemologies. Now I have a name so I can talk about it. She then also criticised me for not mentioning classism enough, to which I, well, I didn't say it, but to which I thought, okay, mine was like the only project that was mildly, well, mine was the only project that was intersectional, and I did mention class, but just because I didn't mention it a lot, that's what got picked up on. Kind of reminded me of this, I can't remember where I read it, but it was talking about, what's that film about the woman who designs a mop and then becomes really famous after she's designed a mop. It's got who's it's got that woman in it who dated Chris Martin from Coldplay for a while. Can't remember her name. Um, and I remember somebody uh, reading somewhere at the time. Somebody saying like, okay, so white women get to get to be in films and about mops <laughs> or like you know stories about white women or about their success in designing a mop but stories about brown women have to be about racism hardship and protest and all this other stuff you get my meaning so on the second day of the conference after no one said anything to my um plea or to my demand same as plea to you know scrutinize our epistemology scrutinize our ways of knowing the next day somebody uh, presented a project and it was something like a guerrilla feminist musicology. And this project suggested that 
instead of being really obvious and instead of kind of like quote unquote attacking things like curriculum and instead of going in full force and claiming that things are changed and claiming that um, other musicians, other musicologists, other sound artists are represented, other composers, other meaning uh, anything that's non non cis white male. Actually, in this context, though, the people were specifically talking about women. Actually, instead of like banging on about it, this is how I interpreted it. Be subtle. Be subtle in our roles. In our roles as lecturers, as um, um, seminar um, leaders, in our roles as um, test instructors, instructor, <laughs> instructors, <gasps> test instructors, that's something, test instructors, um, in our role as jury members, you know, we're subtle. We introduce a female composer here, a female composer there, uh, a performer here, a performer there. We, we, we introduce subtly these others onto the lists. We introduce these others onto these lists, these lists which up until that point have been created by the norm and just perpetuate the norm. And everyone loved it. Everybody in the conference absolutely loved this idea of being subtle, of, of being slow and calm and patient and just popping in a Clara Schumann or popping in a Marian Anderson. I'm sure they wouldn't have popped Marian Anderson in. Into these lists so that when the students take these lists home and they have to revise a piece, practice a piece, research something, they will have you know, experienced this alternative body of knowledge through this surreptitious placing of names on a list in a, is it subterfuge? Is that the word? Putting it in there without being allowed, just slipping it in. I mean, there are aspects of, you know, breaking the rules and being cheeky that I really like. But one thing that really... Um, struck me and kind of made me so angry that of course I didn't say anything was this idea of chipping away exactly one of the musicians that I first interviewed in 2017 said to me it's like we're chipping away it's like we're chipping away every day at this big solid block and we're getting nowhere and it's exhausting Chipping away, actually, I use that title for a piece which I'll play later. Someone in the conference recommended the book After Adorno by Tia Donora, music sociologist, which talks about uh, feminist strategies in musicology, but specifically about not naming them feminist strategies. Well, this is what I've heard anyway. I did order it, but it's got lost in the post. Corona. Corona post, I suppose. Hope it arrives soon. An yes. easy one. Yes, yes, yes. What yes. is the shape of your silhouette? Yes. Does it yes. fit? Yes, yes, yes. Is it a perfect fit? Yes. Yes. Does it really fit though? Do you ask me that question to decide whether what I have to say is worth listening to? Do you ask me that question to decide whether what I have to say is worth listening to? Do you ask me that question to decide whether what I have to say is <laughs> worth listening to? <laughs> Para, 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 para
Earlier this year, I created a piece, a radio song sound piece for Savvy Contemporary in Berlin called A Perfect Fit. I mean, it's a very recent piece, so I feel quite attached to it still, but it felt like an important piece because I chose to try I chose to try to deal with this idea of being marginalised or let's say having a marginalised perspective from an apparent privileged position and what that means in terms of responsibility and what that means in terms of uh, expectations. So being the only person of colour in a musicology department and then refusing to work on the diversity concept. Like, what does that mean? Does that send out the, air quotes, correct message to the students, to the students of colour who I'm potentially representing? Does it send out the right message to the other people in the department? Or are they getting the wrong message? And what is the wrong message? What do they even think? Does it even matter? Hmm. But in this piece, it was really important for me to highlight, it was really important for me to try to highlight this conflict of having power, but not having power. And sort of to remind people, I'm not sure what people, I suppose people like me or people who know me, people who would experience a person like me, to remind us <laughs> that it involves everybody, it involves everybody sort of working, working together to sort of break down these norms but also highlighting the contradictions, the contradictions and the lack of nuance and how people think about their situations. So much privilege in the margins. How do we deal with that and how do, if we do choose that as a topic of our work, how do we then represent that in form? Form and content. Content, sure, but form. Who's even listening to our pieces? I mean, you heard me earlier. I couldn't even decide who it was for, even though I'm sure I do know who it was for. Who's even listening to this work in which we're questioning our limited power?
questions unanswered and you answer my questions unanswered and you answer my questions unanswered and you answer my question unanswered I'm tired I'm tired Um Did you decide if this was for you? Step, 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 step
my questions unanswered and you answer my questions unanswered and you in this piece in particular, I was really happy to return to some singing. Started off actually as a singer-songwriter, the age of hmm, 14, 15, 16, 17, all the way up to 20 probably, Nottingham and then in Berlin. Then I discovered electro pop, which was really nice. Late nights and squat bars with Daphne Della Daphne. We still do stuff together, it's just a bit on the back burner. I liked, I liked doing electro pop music because it allowed me to take myself a bit less seriously or at least to pretend I could take myself a bit less seriously singing sort of feminist, feminist electro pop songs in bright costumes. I think I was during my phase of wanting to be a bit like MIA, which I don't know if it's really gone away. I guess that's my guilty, guilty secret, guilty pleasure. Um, despite her problems, problematic views, but I loved, I loved singing in this piece and I asked myself like, why am I suddenly singing in this piece after maybe mm -hmm. the last time I did a, a song piece was with the Usher of Up pieces in Ausland where I created yeah. me singing to two versions of my other voice, like two, two pre-recorded tracks of me singing. And then like one live voice, so there was three together. So um, I quite liked that. I'll take it to why I keep returning to the voice and why I talk all the time and why I insisted on doing a pre-recorded lecture which is me walking around my kitchen talking into my zoom recorder and um, made me think of a uh, a talk that I listened to the other day Re really the other day funny enough I listened to it in my residency space and um, um, a colleague of mine recommended it to me. The title was something like Anti-Racism in Institutions and I thought, oh my God, this is going to be great. I need to listen to this. It's going to really relate to my PhD, PhD research about um, racism in institutions and the music context and how I can relate it back. And I started listening to it and it was um, a conversation between so it was a conversation between Ranji Shah and they're a performance artist, originally from the UK, but now in Australia, I believe. And um, 
Riona Mitra, who I believe is originally from India, but now lives in the UK. And uh, Riona is uh, a theatre practitioner and scholar and researcher at Brunel, I think. And I thought, even in the introduction that they gave, I thought, oh, this is going to be a bit more artistic. And you'll never guess what. Ranji and Rihanna, over the course of a few weeks in November, they exchanged voice messages on WhatsApp, exactly like what me and my friend Maya were doing in the residency space. So I'm now sitting in my residency space, that the space that I do not think I deserve, the space that I do not think I'm using properly. I've got my feet up, I've made a cup of tea, I'm quaffing down the chocolate, and I've just sent my friend Maya a voice message and I turn on this talk and it's voice messages and it's beautiful and it's I'm not sure what I was expecting I think I was expecting more strategy building and how to do how to do anti-racist work in the institutions but it wasn't it was storytelling it was the two of them exchanging experiences stories about about why they do or don't do anti-racism work. Rihanna Mitra is, um, has a role at her university which requires her to do diversity work in this way that Sarah Ahmed talks about it. And uh, Rihanna even mentions this, quote Sarah Ahmed and this idea of the plumber. The plumber does the work and it either creates a blockage or creates a flood which I quite liked, and I was happy to be reminded of that. Um, what I also thought was nice about it was just the storytelling element. And then I had to, I reminded myself of something that Shana Almeida said when talking about race-based epistemologies and how, you know, the dominant culture or thinkers and makers and artists and researchers of the dominant culture might question indigenous epistemologies, race-based epistemologies, feminist epistemologies for, no, you're just telling a story. This is unreliable. You're just telling a story. Well, ultimately, they just told a story, right? They just told it louder and with a bit more power behind them. And maybe they were standing on a platform hundreds of years ago. But it's all just storytelling. So I quite liked this return to that. But what I really liked, see, Ranji Shah works with listening. Ranji Shah works with listening labs. And um, and I thought, oh, this is good. This is interesting. Not heard of them before. And Ranji was talking about um, how they work with listening. They work with listening a lot. And during the the voice messages back and forth, which again I thought, wow, this is amazing. Um, also because I couldn't remember how to actually extract a WhatsApp voice message from my phone and I remember it being such a long procedure like having to put it through um, a sound card and then it only coming out on one tra um, on one uh, channel and then like losing one, I think it was only ever came out on the right. So then I ha made a little mental note of having to go back and remember how to do that because of course I would have to extract all the ones from Maya. Anyway. Ranji and Rihanna talk about this idea of listening and together they come up with the conclusion that maybe Ranji Shah works with listening so much, listening labs and listening care, works with it so much from a fear of not being heard. And I thought, I thought that was pretty clever. And I thought, okay, all right, Shanti, you speak a lot. You do your radio, and you sing, and you use your voice. Voice comes up all the time. You've written pieces on voice, voicing up. And I thought, do I work with singing and speaking for fear of losing my own voice? Is that the reason why I use my voice to demarcate space? Is that the reason why I use my voice to be heard? Is that the reason why I won't shut up? It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine.
This, this is safe is space. A safe space. This is a safe space. This is a safe this space. They call a safe this space. They call a safe They space. have a safer space policy. They have a they don't tolerate space racism, policy. sexism, homophobia, they don't tolerate body racism, shaming, sexism, homophobia, trans. They have body a shaming. policy. They have a policy. Everyone is happy here. Everyone is happy here. You are too sensitive. You're making it up. You are. You're making it up. Everyone is happy here. This is a safe space. This is a safe space. It's fine. It's fine. It's totally fine. It's fine. It's fine. It, it's totally fine. It's fine. Thank you so much for your support. It's fine. It's fine. It's fine. I'm sure you've been through a lot too. Go ahead. Sure. Sorry. You have had to deal with a lot too. Being a woman. Be being a woman. Men feel threatened when you're a woman. Thanks for your support. Yes, yes. Maybe they've never seen someone like me before. Someone who looks like me. Dresses like me. I'm sure, yes. I'm sure they were just trying to be charming. I'm sure they were just trying to be funny. Maybe it was their way of making me feel welcome. Because I'm beautiful. That's, that's kind of you to say. You, you are beautiful too. Everyday verbal, non-verbal, and environmental slights, snubs, or insults, intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely on their marginalized group membership. Everyday verbal, non-verbal, and environmental slights, snubs, or insults, intentional or unintentional, which communicate hostile, derogatory, or negative messages to target persons based solely on their marginalized group membership. Wir haben das nicht bei uns, oder? Nee, gar nicht. Also bei uns läuft es anders, oder? So sind wir nicht. Nee, nee, kann nicht sein. So sind wir nicht. Ja, eigentlich müssen wir, naja, man muss eigentlich ganz vorsichtig sein. Ähm, man kann ja nicht immer wissen, was jemandem wehtun wird. Und ja, ob die dann irgendeine Biografie haben, die dann verletzt wird durch, ja, keine Ahnung, durch, durch verschiedene Wörter oder Benehmen. Also ich glaube, deswegen müssen wir sozusagen wirklich auch aufeinander aufpassen und auch so, naja, so gucken, dass wir dann Sachen machen, die dann andere nicht wehtun oder nicht verletzen und, und auch voll richtig gut, ich meine so selbst positionieren, dass, wir, dass es ganz klar ist, was wir denn sind oder wofür wir spielen und dass wir dann eigentlich, wenn wir eigentlich solidarisch miteinander arbeiten. You're not racist. But you looked at me really strangely. You didn't laugh at my joke as you went through my bag. Schade. 
What's your fucking problem? He's looking at me funny. He is. He's looking at me really funny. There. There it is. You couldn't even smile when you handed me the drink. Fuck's sake. Is this money not good enough? This skirt not short enough? Do you think I'm going to steal something? Can you let me out the door, please? Can you stop staring at my fucking hair? So what then is the link between listening and the voice? I'm not sure that I or we need a specific answer to that. It's probably something that's going to accompany me throughout all my work. Started reading Glitch Feminism recently, but I also started reading The Race of Sound. I like to read books simultaneously because everything's connected anyway <laughs> um nina san Eidson, the race of sound listening timbre and vocality in african-american music i thought i'd just read it because you know i've got a bit of extra time i'm privileged enough to have time to read because i'm in the research phase which is amazing this book has blown my mind really talks about how listeners create the sound of a voice and you know uses that to explain why certain african-american opera singers from the 30s or the 50s or even the 80s in america you know no matter how they sang they were always sort of referred to as having husky voices full of sorrow and pain of their whole people or even more directly critiqued for you know only having voices suitable to sing poor poor G or to sing bess or to sing spirituals but you know that comes from the listener doesn't it that comes from what the listener decides to put on the sound based on what they can see, based on what they know. Because she argues that that colour, so to speak, that race, that gender can't be heard, that class can't be heard in the voice in itself. It can't be heard in the mechanics and the an anatomy and the physiognomy, physiology of the voice. It all comes from the listener. I had to I had to think back to the conference, the gender in musicology conference, where I talked about my project and where no one said anything, no one said anything apart from the very nice responder who was supposed to say something. And I had to think to myself, what were they listening to? I mean, yeah, the conference was on Zoom, but you could still see me. And I was speaking in German about a project that I'm eventually gonna write about in English, which I think about in English. And I used the word racism quite a few times. And uh, what did they, what did they, listen to what did they what meaning did they create from what i was saying based on how i was presenting it should i have done the more 
guerrilla feminist style, subtle, subtle approach and not mention the R word. Should I have done a, a secret feminist, a secret anti-racist musicology approach? Would my physical appearance and the way I presented the idea have had such an effect on how they heard it? Or let me say it the other way around. Would their listening have really been that much affected by how I presented it? Maybe I should do an experiment next time. I'll ask one of my um, colleagues to read out my project instead of me. see if it has a different response. Nobody said anything. It was the only project where no one said anything. Incredible. What are the things you name? What are the things you don't name? So, all in all, in this little, let's call it an extended anecdote of my work, my practice, how it all links together, how not, we've got space, we've got claiming space, fear of losing space. We've got the strategies within the space stretching to make the money fit, to make yourself fit, rejecting because you don't want to fit. They don't want you anyway. And then enduring, enduring and chipping away to create a different space that you can then fit into. And then when you're just given this space, you're so freaked out, you don't know what to do with it. You're panicking just because you didn't read all the Judith Butler books on the shelf. And you're speaking, you're speaking because you're afraid you're gonna lose your voice. Or are you speaking to challenge its own sound, to challenge those listeners who are creating meaning from your voice? Or are you speaking to be named? Are you saying things the whole time? This is feminist, this is feminist, this is racist, this is racist. Are you saying things the whole time to make sure it's heard? Should you try and be subtle? One of my colleagues who I greatly admire told me once that I should be less jokey, more serious in my presentation. I wonder if they meant more secure, less insecure. Either way, I partly paid attention to it. But it keeps coming up, this idea. Quiet down, make yourself smaller, even with this power and privilege I now have. The power and privilege, which means I can spend a whole morning reading a book if I want to. Couldn't have ever done that before. And what does it even mean from this position and what, what are we expected to carry with this voice? What are we expected to carry? What am I expected to carry with this voice that I keep using and keep filling space with. Who else am I supposed to carry with this voice? And will someone tell me if I've forgotten somebody? Will someone tell me if I've forgotten something? Wait, maybe it's speaking and using my voice for fear of nobody addressing me, for fear of nothing addressing me. Speaking and using my voice, not for fear of losing my voice, but 
for fear of not being spoken to. 